Welcome to the Pastor's Study, a program designed to help you answer your questions. You can call, email, or text your questions to us, and our panel of pastors will give you answers from the Word of God. What is God's will? What happens when you die? Does God really care about me? If you have questions like these, then pull up a chair and join us in the Pastor's Study. Hello and welcome to the Pastor's Study. We've got a great program tonight, and it's one of the type of programs that you can actually interact with. It's an interactive program. Uh, So if there are things that you always wanted to ask a pastor, but were intimidated or too scared, now's your chance. All you have to do is call, text, or email. The number that you can call and ask a question live is area code 719 820-9280. You can also text that number. And uh, the topic for tonight is discipleship. It might be a topic that you're familiar with, but we're going to talk about it in depth. We're going to go at it from a couple of different angles, from being the discipler to the one being discipled. Uh, are you being discipled? Uh, do you uh, have people that you are discipling? And what is the importance of it? And what does God's Word have to say about it? We've got a great um, host of people here on the show that are well qualified to answer your questions, and I'm going to go around. My name is Paul Kendall, and I pastor, and we just had a name change. We just merged, so I have to say it right, United Family Church in Louisville, and uh, that's the church that I pastor, and I'm just going to go around and let each guest um, introduce themselves. Uh, My name is Bianca Richardson, and I'm the senior pastor at St. James Baptist Church, where we believe in connecting community to faith. And so why don't you join us on our virtual service uh, if you have any time on uh, Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. My name is Alex McFarland, and for 23 years I've led Truth for a New Generation, a youth ministry all over the country. But I'm also in Greensboro, the interim pastor at Good Shepherd Church, and their Facebook page is Good Shepherd Church of Greensboro, where we stream every Sunday morning at 10:15 a.m. Hey, I'm Chip Rice, and I'm the pastor of Maranatha Fellowship in High Point, North Carolina, and have been there for 11 years, and I'm excited to be here on the pastor study today. Well, I'm going to start us off by reading the golden. Uh, Bible verse about discipleship. It's Matthew 28, 18. You're probably familiar with it. And then we're just going to take it from there. And again, don't hesitate to pick up the phone and call in and ask your questions. Matthew 28, 18 says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go there, therefore, and make disciples to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Pastor Richardson, what do you think that means? So um, really when I look at this particular text, uh, there are actually six things that I see in this text. The first thing is, is that we have to acknowledge the power of Jesus. In in, uh, verse 18, it says, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And so uh, when we are discipling or when we are walking as even as a disciple, we must recognize first uh, that the power of Jesus is what we ought to lean into. Um, The second thing is movement is going. The third the third thing is and actually this particular scripture says teaching twice. The first time it says teaching is in 19 and the second time it says teaching is in 20 which tells me that discipleship is relational Uh, it is not just dropping off after uh, one has uh, taught about the kingdom uh, but actually going back and walking through uh, being a disciple with someone else so that's another thing just to pull out of this text and i love how verse 20 talks about Uh, I am with you always so that we are comforted in knowing uh, that this is a promise that we have from Jesus, uh, that he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us always. And so we are not alone even on our walk as a disciple and as discipling others. 
Yes, amen. Dr. McFar McFarlane, what's your thoughts? Oh, I love this passage. I'm glad we're in this Matthew 28 passage. You know, all authority is given to me on heaven and earth. Jesus has the authority and he conveys that to his church. It's very interesting. More than 200 times in the New Testament, there's the uh, talk of power and authority being given to the church. Now, it's interesting here. The word in, in Matthew 28, 18 here is really the word for jurisdiction. And we're living in a world where there are all sorts of belief systems and there's a lot of darkness in the world today. But this world is under God's authority. And when we go forth to preach the gospel and to make disciples and to groom disciples, we're on God's turf uh, because he's got all the authority. Now in Acts 1.8 it says that he gives us power and that's ability power, but this means authority power. And so we go forth boldly and confidently in his name. I think most people would say, or at least it's common to say that when the door opens for me to share the gospel with somebody, I don't because I just, I don't feel like I should impose or I have the authority uh, to speak into this person's life, but it's not our authority. It's Jesus' Jesus. authority, amen? His authority that we, that we carry with us and we represent him. So we do have the authority to speak in his name. Yes. Yeah, I think that's something important to remember is that it's not in our authority. It's in the authority of Jesus Christ. And he says, I will be with you. How long? Even to the end of the age. That's kind of forever. Uh, certainly on this world, on this earth for sure. Uh, Dr. Ice, what are your thoughts about that passage? Um, it's an extremely interesting passage because it's something that's given to all of the believers. Um, I think a lot of times that people think the onus should be on the pastors or the leaders in the church to go make disciples. It should be on the people who have leadership and authority. And so uh, he didn't say that in the statement. He just said go. And so go means everybody. And I think what's really interesting there is when he says make disciples. And so I kept thinking about like, how can you make a disciple? What does that look like? What is it supposed to be? And so I have some thoughts concerning that, but I want to hear what the other pastors are saying to, to kind of help me to, to flesh all of that out. But, but something that I took away from that is, uh, is what um, Pastor Richardson said about being relational, that you have to, you can't just give them the gospel, but now you have to form a relationship with them and what that's going to look like. Dr. Richardson, how do you see that playing out in the real world, that relationship forward slash discipleship? Um, well, how I see that playing out is really it's about, one, it's about communication. Uh, two, it's about uh, sharing your own testimony. And I think that is uh, very important. Um, and, and in that, it's not necessarily, uh, as you mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily like imposing, but truly being led of the Holy Spirit in a conversation. It's very interesting how uh, there have been times that I personally have uh, went to Starbucks and decided to sit down and God sends, it's just like starting to have a conversation with someone in Starbucks. And th those are those opportunities that we find that it's not necessarily in a church setting all the time, but sometimes uh, God opens those doors uh, as we are having conversation uh, to actually share the gospel. So I think sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm gonna wait for the event at the church to share the gospel. I'm going to have a special event just to evangelize. And I think uh, evangelism is obviously communicating about grace, but discipleship is that walking it through with someone, going back to that relational that I, that I, uh, that I talked about. And when Dr. Rice is talking about um, making disciples, and I think that that's how we make disciples, is we have to share our testimony uh, as we uh, live and apply it uh, in conversation, in our life. We are literally epistles read of men. Right. So it's not just about what we talk about, it's also about what we live. Right, right. I was at a church for four years, and um, Years later, I would see people in the mall or in the store, and uh, they would say things that they remembered. And I think if anybody would have asked me, 
What are these people going to remember about you? I would have thought it was, oh, that powerful message I preached on the book of James. Or <laughs> I was the worship leader too, so I would think, wow, that time when the Spirit moved and we just sang for an hour, you know? But people didn't bring stuff up like that. I was really blown away. They would say things like, you know what I remember about you? I remember how you came in and sat with your family every Sunday. Or... Um, one of the other pastors told me years later, you know what I remember the most about you is how you finished every conversation with your wife and your kids by saying, I love you. And uh, she said, we, we weren't used to saying that, but that really influenced us, and it, it became normal in our household. I, I, it's like the old saying, um, preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. What are some other ways, Dr. McFarland, that, that we disciple people? Well, well, you really hit the nail on the head that a lot of it is uh, caught just by our lifestyle that we may not even realize we're projecting forth. You know, the word disciple is a fascinating word, and it comes from the Jewish culture back then. The rabbi, or sometimes called rebbe, was a teacher. And for a, a, a respected rabbi to invite you to be his disciple, that was a real honor. And when Jesus said, you know, come, follow me, I will make you fishers of men, or when Jesus invites any of us to be saved and then to grow, it really is an honor that the greatest teacher of all, the Son of God, would invite us to be his disciple. Um, I've, I've read that a disciple is a consistent, learning, obedient follower. A consistent, learning, obedient follower. And I love America. I, I mean, there are like 345,000 churches in America. I love the church. I really do. But sometimes I have to ask ourselves if, if we've really made disciples. Now, there, there are lots of people that have recited a prayer, uh, but going to heaven is not the only part of the Christian life, although obviously that's a great thing to be born again, to know Christ and go to heaven when we die. But it, it's to be a disciple, a follower of His every moment of every day as well. And I think we need to tell that to people, yes. that Jesus is offering you a life of being his disciple. Right, and a disciple maker. Amen. If I understand Matthew 28, 18 right, it's not a suggestion, it's a command. Yes. Dr. Rice, what are some of those other thoughts that you have? I'm curious. So, so I, think what's, I think it's really cool what Dr. McFarlane said because Jesus asked us to be his disciples, which is absolutely bananas because yeah. if we think about who we really are or even where we started out um, because all of us weren't weren't clean fish when we came into the kingdom and so he would ask somebody who was so frail who was so crazy who is so convoluted who has all these crazy ideas you want me to help you get this message out to other people is crazy and so I think about um, Matthew a lot how he was sitting there working in one of the worst jobs uh, as far as his culture was concerned. People hated this guy. And Jesus rolls up on him and says, hey, follow me. And what's, what it, the, the thing I love about discipleship is what he did after that. He got up from where he was, and then he went and had a party for Jesus because that's all he knew how to do. He was like, this is what I'm used to. And so what I've learned over time is I can't, expect people to be saved, sanctified, holy, acceptable in all their actions as soon as they come to Christ. That's the discipling piece. So I understand, okay, you've got some things that are going on with you, but I'm going to work with you because I want you to be a disciple. We see it in Peter's life. We see it in the disciples' life. We see it in the disciples' family's life where, you know, mom was trying to say, hey, can you get my boys here and get them a, a big title? And so Learning about people and understanding that we all have some desires and things that maybe they're not really holy desires, but God still works with us because he's discipling us and has the expectation that we should be doing that for other people. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that makes me think about this. I, uh, something I hear common, Dr. Richardson, is who am I to disciple somebody? I have flaws myself. And by the way, I tell people if... Perfection is the qualification necessary for ministry. Not only would the pew be empty, the pulpit would be empty too. Mm -hmm. What would you tell to, to say to somebody that says, I'm not qualified, I don't know enough, I haven't been to Bible school? 
Well, I, I would say that's where the testimony comes in because as Dr. Rice said, we're, we're not perfect. When we came into this thing of salvation, uh, I wasn't a clean fish. Um, I've, had, uh, I've had a process and that's where my testimony comes in to say, listen, uh, this is the process that I personally have gone through. I am not perfect. I'm still not perfect. God is still working on me. Um, and this is that testimony for they overcome by the word of our testimony. And I think that's where that is so important um, as well is to share that is to let people know, listen, you may see uh, senior pastor Bianca Richardson right now, but I wasn't always, I wasn't always in church. I wasn't always, and I think that is another thing of being a disciple is also being honest yeah. about where we came from and our process. Right. right, yeah, I decided a long time ago, because there seems to be an undue pressure, at least I have felt on pastors to know the answer to everything. <laughs> So I got used to um, saying, I don't know. I honestly don't know. I'll tell you what, there, you know, th this program, uh, for a long time I, I didn't want to come on it because I was afraid, what if somebody asked me a question to explain Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel? You know, and I'm thinking, oh, wow, I just don't know. To be comfortable with saying, I don't know. So the, if I don't know the answer, my answer is I don't know. I found that true, and even in counseling. And I also found out that people respect that. You don't have to have the answer to everything. If you really care about somebody, you can say, you know, I honestly don't know, but I'll tell you what, I'll study it out this, this week and uh, we'll get back together again and I'll tell you what I've learned and what I see in God's word about that thing. We don't have to be experts in every scripture in the 66 books of the Bible to be able to disciple somebody else. Dr. McFarland, what, what would, how would you combat the concept of, well, the church is just full of hypocrites because ain't none of them perfect, and they're wow. trying to teach me? And, and it's true. Now, if you're a Christian, you're a saved hypocrite, but uh, you know, I, I've told people that, uh, like that. The, the church does have hypocrites, uh, but so does the lost world, so you're in the boat either way. You might as well come on in and get saved and be a, at least a saved hypocrite. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we are, you know, in Galatians 5, it, it says, you know, the fruits of the Spirit are love and joy and peace and patience, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering. There's an interesting word, one, um, the, the King James says, against such there is no law. And I thought, I wonder what that means. And I did a little study on that. One of the things it means is that, that you can't argue with it. When, when you're bearing the fruits of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit controls you, even the lost world would say, hey, that man is authentic. You know, even an unbeliever should be able to say, this person is genuine. And so um, we, we have a true message, but we are to be true messengers. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not perfect. I, I, I agree with you on saying I don't know. Uh, we've had a lot of people ask questions over the years, uh, some we know, and... Um, Sometimes I'll say, you know, I don't know. Goodness, that's a great question. Give me some time. I'll get back to you. And I've had people, unsaved people say, hey, I appreciate that, right. that you're being honest with me. So um, I, I really think to know Christ and to represent Christ is the greatest thrill in the world. It's so exciting to be a Christian. And oh my goodness, to be a Christian in the 21st century, it's really an exciting time. Yeah. Yes, it is. And seemingly more needed now than ever. Oh, this, this world needs Jesus. Yeah. This nation needs Jesus. Yeah, I have, um, the metaphor I've used is that the heat is being turned up in society. We have tension on top of tension. We have racial tension, racial injustice, tension on top of political tension, on top of COVID tension. Yes. Yeah. So, Dr. Rice, what are... What are some of your encouragements or thoughts for a person that feels like it's almost impossible to even open my mouth for fear of offending one side or the other? Um, well, <laughs> I've, I've come to the realization that uh, if you're going to live for Christ, you're going to say some things that are going to offend people. But I've also learned that there are people who care nothing about Christ 
and say things to offend people. I would rather give you truth right, and then let the truth offend you and let and you deal with it from there right. than to be scared not to tell you the truth about a situation. Um, we live in an extremely opinionated society. Social media has given everybody a voice to, to say what your opinion is and which, which causes us to get away from truth and what, uh, what God is really saying. And so sometimes you can, you can have a thought, but then you see somebody on social media say something else about it. And you're like, well, I wonder if I'm right, if I'm wrong. You know, this is where we've got to go to prayer and study of the word. Right. And so it's, it's, we're obligated individually, whether you're a pastor, elder, pew member, whatever you are, everybody's supposed to study to show themselves proved unto God. And then once you started studying, God will put somebody in your life who needs what it is that you've learned uh, from him concerning scripture. And that makes it comfortable because there are people who, don't, who can't spell exegete. Matter of fact, sometimes when I get ready to write it down, say, uh, <laughs> but then, but you ha have had an experience with God yourself and you've seen something in the Bible that you can communicate to somebody else to help them grow in their relationship with God. And so uh, we have to be like uh, Peter and pray for that boldness to be able to declare and help other people become strong in the faith. Yes. Well, I liked everything you said, but one thing really stood out to me was that the truth will offend, but that doesn't give me a right to offend. Right. Uh, my speaking the truth, the truth might offend someone, but what is common now, and boy, I see this just all over social media, is to uphold, protect, and support this one, I have to disrespect and condescend this one. And right. that's where the trouble starts. It, it is absolutely ridiculous. And um, with the racial tension that's going on in America now, it's like, yeah, I'm standing up for my rights and you people are wrong. It's like, you could be right in most of your areas, but are you open to hearing the areas where you're off? And so and then we get a group of us together and say, we're all right. Uh, and I'm just like, wow, this is ridiculous. You know, we're, everybody wants to be right, but nobody wants to stop and listen and say, could I have the wrong perspective on this? Right. Uh, am I getting the wrong information? And so America, it, that's Amer America's biggest sin right now is pride. Yes. yes. We, we are very prideful people. And so if we're going to disciple others, we have to humble ourselves and we have to teach them that that's what God is looking for, to humble yourself. And I would say, going back to the concept of preach the gospel and when necessary, use words, I, I guess that would mean preaching actual scripture, and I'm going to refer to social media, which is using words, but our, even our social media is a form of discipleship, whether we're doing it intentionally or not. People are watching what we say, what we do, how we uh, respond to others, how we treat others. What is the passage that says they'll know that we're Christians by our love, by right? Our love, yes. And the other passage, I can't call the chapter and verse right now, but it says that uh, we will be judged by what? Our words, our words. <laughs> That's a scary thought, isn't it? Uh, on social media, it certainly is. <laughs> yeah. Well, and you know, Ecclesiastes, it's either 1214 or 1412. I always get it backwards. Either 1214 or 1412, but it says there's no secret thing uh, that won't be brought into judgment, in, including every word. And, and I think about that, and boy, you know, we uh, rejoice that our sins are washed away in the blood of Jesus if we're born again, because all of us have said words that we wish we hadn't have said, and, and maybe tweeted something that we regret. And so social media, like you say, brother, it's pride. People can just, you know, fire off some thought that may be, you know, the Bible talks about building each other up. Well, a lot of words are thrown out there to tear each other down. Yeah. And uh, we will give an account for the words that we say. Yeah. 20 years ago, to think that every word could be recorded, you know, what well, was the old pamphlet, This Is Your Life, you know, that they would attract, that they would hand out. And it showed the guy standing in front of the screen. And, and we thought, oh, man, that would be impossible to have a recording of the whole purpose, the whole, the purpose, the person's whole life. <laughs> Uh, but now it's very, it's very believable. If you want to, to become a believer, 
that every word you have ever put out there is available to somebody, just run for political office. <laughs> right. They will exactly. find it, right? Find it. Okay, find so it. every word, and I mean, you think about that, it, it's, it's more realistic to think now that every word I tweet, every word I post, every, really every word I say, I mean, even with cameras now. Probably almost every email you've ever sent. Yes. Probably That's could right. be retrieved. Right. Yes. Right. And you, so. can't, you can't do anything in our neighborhood anymore. I got a ring doorbell. My neighbor's got them. <laughs> you know, so anything happens, mm -hmm. we call this one. Did you get it? Catch it? Oh, I caught it on my camera. I guess my only point is that every word really is powerful and makes a difference. Well, we've got a caller on the line. Caller, let's hear your question. Yes, my question is, how can you lovingly and respectfully correct your sister or brother in Christ who made a false statement about the Bible or have a false belief? Great question. Great question. Well, uh, by the way, thanks for listening. Thanks for calling in. You know, uh, w I love what Billy Graham used to say. The evangelist Billy Graham would always say, the Bible says, the Bible says, and I had a, a teacher once who said when you're having to go over a hard uh, conversation with somebody, try with the power of the Holy Spirit to, it's not me versus you, but it's us together in search of the truth. And, and with God's help to be humble, but to always let the Bible correct any of our misconceptions or wrong words. And we might say, hey, I love you, and please, I'm not coming you know, to demean you or anything. But let's read this together. What does the Word of God say? Because um, any of us could be wrong. Uh, Lord knows I, I've been wrong countless times, but the Word of God is always right. right. And, and br I, I would say, try with the Spirit's help, bring it back to the Scripture. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Yeah, and I, I have a couple thoughts about that. One is, I, th I think the key today is... Respect, R-E-S-P-C-T. Uh, we can respectfully disagree. Because I have a different view than you doesn't mean that one of us is bad and the other one's good, or the other one's smart and the other one's dumb, or, you know, but if you're, if you're defending God's word, that's a little bit different because you know his word is true. But I think respect really should rule the day. Respect and love you know, Jesus said the greatest of all these commandments is to love, love your neighbor as yourself, you know, love God with all your heart, soul, and your mind, and love others as you love yourself. You should be able to have a respectful um, conversation with somebody. You know, I don't like broccoli. People think I'm weird because I don't like broccoli. You can argue all day that I should like broccoli, and I just don't like broccoli. But that doesn't make me weird. Uh, maybe, we're gonna pray for you. yeah, <laughs> I, I, I've heard all of it. Uh, it's a joke at our church, but uh, my whole point is I can respect you for liking broccoli. You can respect me for not. We're just different, okay? So I would say um, discuss things in a respectful way and then also be careful to listen to the Apostle Paul's instruction to his young pastors he was raising up, Timothy and Titus. Don't get involved in, in uh, non-productive squabbles and arguments that go on forever. <laughs> they really don't profit anything. Well, we have a, um, a little spot that we're going to run now to talk about Global Television Network. Listen to this. Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Williams. I want to express to you the importance of supporting Christian television programming. As you are aware, the world is suffering right now, and there is no better hope than the hope that we find in Christ. And Christian television programming helps to bring that to the world in a very unique and impassioned way. No network does that better than Global Television Network. I hope that you will support them. Their information is located on the screen. Global Television Network brings you the best in Christian programming, and you can support them by watching, by praying, and also by offering some financial support. Will you please join me in supporting all of their efforts to help spread the good news of Jesus Christ, not only in your neighborhood, but around the world and in this nation, because we are all in desperate need of Jesus. Well, welcome back to the pastor's study. And uh, I just want to um, echo what the brother just said on that little spot, that this is a tremendous network. 
uh, the things that they are doing here at Global Television Network to make another avenue for the gospel of Jesus Christ to be broadcast all over the world. And uh, so if this is um, a type of ministry that you believe in, maybe you would consider supporting it. Uh, you can send your support to Global Television Network, 300 NC Highway 68 South, 68 South in Greensboro, North Carolina, 27409. It is a worthy investment. You know, we, we want to invest in, um, in, in the economy, in the stock market, because we want to return. This is a different type of investment. You invest here, and it bears much fruit, uh, but your account for that is registered in heaven. And I think that's a greater account. Eternity lasts a whole lot longer than life on this earth. So this is a great place to sow your financial seed into. So I hope you'll support it. Our topic tonight is discipleship. We've had one caller. I've got a feeling there are others out there that are just uh, uh, ready to pick up the phone and call and ask your question, but maybe a little nervous about it. Go ahead. Just call and ask your question. There's no question that's too you know, out there or too stupid. Don't worry about that. Um, we want to hear from you, and we want to answer those questions. Well, I'm going to continue on. Um, John 15, 8 says, But this, my father... Uh, by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. We're disciples of Christ. Um, let me just toss the question out there. What, is, what does that mean to be a disciple of Christ? So um, what I believe it means to be a disciple of Christ is uh, a follower. It is uh, a follower in that following or practicing, if you will, the doctrine of Jesus. Um, there, there are so many uh, people out there who uh, may have an idea that making disciples mean uh, that you follow what I say and you become my disciple, but we are really supposed to point people to Jesus and his message. Something that Dr. McFarlane said earlier uh, was we have a message. And I think it's so important that we uh, focus on the message of Jesus. And that is what a disciple is, focusing on that doctrine, those precepts, love, respect. You talked about respect. All of those things, those are biblical principles that I think uh, defines what a disciple is and the representation of a disciple. You're a pastor. How important do you think it is? And I know you, 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 we're not talking about elevating or putting a pastor on a pedestal, but how important is it for a person to be in a good church and be discipled by a pastor? Oh, I think it's very important. I think um, it's you know, some, some people feel like they can just read the Bible and uh, not have anyone to talk to and, 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 and uh, actually, actually point them. But I think it's so important to have a trustworthy, good leadership that so walks in humility. Uh, and, and that humility yeah. is the part of being okay. a disciple right. as well and question. teaching You'll others about being a disciple. Okay, is, uh, right, it goes thank back to, right, thank you. I don't have all the answers. It's okay for me to say, I don't know. It's okay for me to show you that uh, uh, being a disciple of Jesus is not about perfection. Um, it's not about, uh, you know, having this, this title or having uh, this particular, uh, uh, I guess, sense of perfection or getting everything right, but actually walking through uh, a process and uh, eventually seeing deliverance or eventually seeing healing in a particular area, but how important it is to have that person to uh, spar with and to talk with and to point you. I think it's very important. A shepherd. A shepherd, a shepherd. yes. Well, we've got another caller on the line. Go right ahead with your question. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask, do you have any advice for people that want to be more evangelistic or fulfill their discipleship, but have a guiltiness about things they've done in the past and really haven't forgiven themselves so it stops them from actually being a disciple to others. Thank you for being brave to call. Dr. Rice, what's your answer? Well, I just, you're just going to have to give up and just say, well, can't do it. Or you can check out that book 
because in that book, starting in Genesis, going well, all the way question, right? to Revelation, there are some people okay. that you, are you just severely just unqualified when they get finished, that have done some of the soon, worst okay? things you could ever do, right, just stay on the line. yet God Thank still you, used them. Uh, you look at you look at a uh, a Noah who saved the world and got drunk. You look at a a David who was a an extremely gifted praise and worship leader who made a booty call. You look at uh you look at all of these. You look at Peter. Peter's walking on water and he's cussing people out in the next. So you have flawed people, and and the beauty of salvation is that God saves you. And then the process starts. He, he knew that you had issues when he gave his son for you, for God so loved the world. So he already knew what he was working with. You should be able to take your experience, your testimony, and use that along with scripture to be able to talk to people and say, man, this is what I went through. This is what my life was like. But when Jesus saved me and I started to learn about who I'm supposed to be and got my purpose together, uh, it changed my life. That's what people are looking for. They're looking for authenticity mm -hmm. to tell people, no, I didn't have it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these That's are good. great questions. Uh, now we've, we've got another caller. Go right ahead with your question. During the old biblical days, many Christians were tortured and persecuted for preaching the gospel. And you even see that during today's society. So how can we as modern day Christians be bold and strong and preach the true gospel, but at the same time, stay safe? Uh, good question. Thank you for calling and asking. Dr. McFarland, what do you think? Well, I, I don't know that you can always preach the gospel and stay safe. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, Christianity is not the subtraction of all your problems. It is the addition of Jesus with you every day through life's problems. That's good. Sometimes life gets complicated when you really do seriously stand strong for Jesus. Um, so uh, we can't really promise that it will always be safe or always be popular, but we can promise that it will always be the right thing to do. Yes. And, uh, you know, we don't ever want to intentionally hurt people's feelings or be abrasive or something like that. But the Bible says rejoice when, when people revile you and curse you and, and uh, demean you and all that. For great is your reward in heaven. Um, and, and I would say if somebody does shut you down or they, uh, whether it's just um, rejection or even overt persecution like in China and parts of the world, I think about North Africa and in so much of the Islamic world, Christians are persecuted. Um, we need to love them and pray for them because the, the more somebody hates Jesus, that's just all the more reason that they need Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, w I would also add to that, you might, um, it might do you well to, to not just read, but bask in Jesus' prayer in um, John chapter 17. He prays to his Father. It's a beautiful prayer. And, and uh, when you read that, Put yourself in the first person that he is praying for me. Some people say, no, he was praying for his disciples. Well, he was, but he also says, and I think it's verse 20, and I don't pray for just these, but also all those who will believe in my name through these. So he's praying that prayer for you. And he actually says that um, the world will hate you. I mean, that's Jesus in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. That's your creator, God, saying that in this world, that you're in. You're in the world, but not of it. There are going to be some people that, that literally hate you. And it's probably not because of you personally. It's because of the truth that you stand for in your Christianity, in your walk, and your faith with Christ. And um, to know that there are going to be some people that you never reach. And uh, one, of the, one of the phrases that really sticks out in that prayer to me, I use it a lot, even personally, as a pastor of a church wondering, why is my church this number of people you know, why this particular group of people? It's the phrase Jesus uses. He says, those you have given me out of the world. Those you have given me. Um, you know, I don't want to take too much time, but there's a whole lot of other teaching about people uh, where Jesus says they're never going to believe you because their hearts are callous and hard and you need to shake the dust off your feet and move on to the next city. That's one category. And those are probably going to be the ones that hate you. 
Uh, but it's the ones that Jesus has given you. Those are the ones that will have an ear to hear that you can see you're beginning to make progress with. And I'd really encourage you to read that prayer, put yourself in the first person that Jesus is praying for, and ask him to give you the spiritual discernment between the ones that will never listen, that are always going to hate you, and the ones that God has given you to disciple. Any other it's, thoughts about that? I would say that's probably, since I'm talking to pastors and to our audience, that's probably the quandary of pastoring, that people come and you have to be able to discern the ones that are just coming for the fish and the loaves, as the scripture mm -hmm. would say, or the ones that have come to be connected to you. Because Jesus even made the statement to his disciples when some people left. He said, are y'all going to leave me too? Mm -hmm. And so I think that one of the, the pandemic has been good for the church because we now understand that you can be mega while you're minor. Mm hmm that you don't have to have people sitting in a sanctuary with five, 10,000 people in order for you to have an audience where you can reach that many people. And I think that we're gonna see in this dispensation, people coming out of the woodwork that have a word from God that are, that are gonna be true to his scripture, that are going to be anointed that we never even heard of yeah. because they're not going to be striving for bright lights and, and big pockets and things like that. They're going to be people that have been discipled mm -hmm. that are now going to come out and give a word from the Lord so that they can make disciples. They've been, boy, they've been somewhere getting pruned mm -hmm. uh, so that they can bear much fruit. Yeah, mm -hmm. and some people hearing the truth now through a computer, phone, or TV screen that maybe never would have actually showed up in the church. Um, yeah, this, this whole uh, crisis and the distancing. I, I love online. We do it. You know, we try to do it as good as we can. I'm, I'm very grateful for it. I do say it's not, it's not a, a substitute for the church assembling together, being together. But it is also having a very unique and different positive effect on people that we maybe would have never reached before. Dr. McFarland, you said that this whole crisis and not being able to have crowds together has changed your whole ministry. How, how are you discipling people in the midst of a crisis like this? Well, well, thanks for asking. You know, um, the global TV has been a big part of our life for two decades. And 20 some years ago, we started doing youth rallies at the Greensboro Coliseum, not too many miles from here, and then went all over the country. And that's been great. Uh, I love events. But, you know, along comes the pandemic. And, and like Chip said, the pandemic has been a great equalizer, hasn't it? And, now, and you're right. I'm hearing anointed people of God that I never would have known about, mm -hmm. you know. But so we started doing streaming and, and through Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 11 a.m. We're on on Facebook and we've had videos that were watched by 21 people. We had a couple that were watched by 51,000 people. But wow. let me say one quick thing about discipleship. I was thinking about this because my wife is a nurse. You know, there's um, an, an obstetrician that delivers a baby, but there's a pediatrician that helps raise the baby. Mm -hmm. Evangelism is like obstetrics. The baby is delivered, but discipleship is like pediatrics. <laughs> the, the child is raised yeah. up. And, and you know, a baby, a baby is delivered. You wouldn't say to an infant, oh, well, very good. Have a nice life. Right. No, you've got to help that baby learn to feed itself. Um, there's several very intense years before that child can be on his own. And if we lead somebody to Christ, and I would encourage everybody, try to lead somebody to Christ You'd be amazed. I was so shy. I was in college when I got saved. I was such an introvert. Never talked to anybody. But I was driving a delivery truck, and eventually, one by one, I got to share the gospel. I would leave a little gospel booklet with customers on my route. I drove a delivery truck. And eventually, one day, a man, he was 20 years older than me, he began to pour out his heart to me about how um, his life was falling apart and his marriage. And, and I, I just very awkwardly, I said, have you ever tried to turn your life over to Jesus? And he said, I don't know how. And oh my goodness, I stumbled and I stammered. It was not articulate. <laughs> and, and I said, would you pray and ask Jesus to come into your life? And he said, yes. And I was like, really? 
<laughs> um, <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> what and in that? and I, after I, I was able to see this man pray and receive Jesus, I mean, his, his very face changed. Mm. But I got in my truck and I was like, dear Jesus, I want to do this every day for the rest of my life. Yeah. I would encourage people, try to talk to folks about Christ. You'd be amazed how many people are hungry to learn about salvation if somebody would tell them. Mm-hmm. And, and the baby is delivered, the newborn babe in Christ. The, the child is discipled and raised up. And that's, that's our calling, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Dr. Richardson, you had a thought about that? So I just want to add to the discussion. We're talking about the pandemic. We're talking about being exposed to ministries and people. And and I just want to say, you know, in addition to that, that this has really, I believe, been a time for the church for also for us to reset. Uh, because so many ministries and churches had gotten off of the message, Dr. Fallon, that you mentioned and that you talked about that we have. We have a message. It's right here in the book. We don't have to conjure something up, right? We have a message, and this truly has been a reset so that we can focus back on the message of Jesus Christ. And I think that is so important for us to not only uh, focus on virtual ministry, but how we can actually uh, train our members even during this time and others on how to do that uh, even during this time, Mm -hmm. even with their family, because think about it, people are at home, they're with their families, there are people in their homes where uh, one might be looking at a gospel show and someone's upstairs looking at something different. This is a wonderful time to not just uh, be a a disciple maker or uh, outside, but why don't we try in our homes first? And so that is, you know, this I think is been an awesome time also for those who are believers to reach out to their family right in their homes. Yes. Yes. In some ways, the um, crisis has distanced us. But if you're like our family, it may be the case with you that we actually call each other more now. (laughs) We FaceTime more. We FaceTime with more relatives in other states Mm -hmm. now because of this. It, It really has changed things. It doesn't mean that you can't contact somebody or or talk to them these days because you can't actually go visit them. This is a great a great topic and I just want to take another minute to uh, encourage you to call in with your questions. We still have a little bit of time left, about 15 minutes, uh, so don't hesitate to call in. But uh, also to remind you once again uh, the importance of Global Television Network. Uh, The people here are amazing people. They have a heart for one thing, and that is to glorify God, uh, to, to uh, broadcast the truth. You know, Isaiah 55, 11 says that uh, it's God speaking. He says, my word never returns void. And then it goes on to say, um, and it will prosper everything it's spoken into. So the truth that goes out over this network actually makes a difference in people's lives. And uh, so I would encourage you to go to the website, look up this network, uh, consider investing in it and supporting it is, is definitely, definitely a worthy cause. Um, another a category of discipleship would be self-discipleship. I mean, you're, you're, you're learning from the Holy Spirit. You know, there's, there's scripture that says, let the, let the Holy Spirit teach you. Uh, by the way, that does not mean you don't need a pastor or you don't need somebody to disciple you, but it means that the, uh, the Holy Spirit is even discipling you through that pastor. And so, um, you know, a lot of Christians don't like to read because they get bored and they maybe they read it at at bedtime until they go to sleep um, because it's not really doing anything for them. I would encourage you to uh, find study tools. They used to be expensive. I remember when I got ordained, I wanted a pulpit commentary set of books on my shelf so it looked like I was really smart, but they were too expensive. I couldn't afford one. And now all of that is free. You, you, Google is a Christian's best friend if right. you use it right. Make right. sure you're, you're landing on reputable sites. That's but Google things. Go to a site like blueletterbible.org and, 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 and study the scriptures. You can click on it, and next thing you know, you've got text commentary. 
you click, now they've got it where you can click on a video and you'll have a, a college, a Bible college professor teaching you that scripture. Uh, dig in and what happens when you study scripture like that, it, be, it, it, it comes alive. Uh, the, the, the analogy, the metaphor I like to use today is it becomes a Netflix series <laughs> that we don't watch every Tuesday night. Now we stay up and binge on all night, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what happens when you study scripture. Uh, it, it, it comes alive to you and you can't get enough of it. What are y'all's thoughts about people digging in and learning God's word? Well, uh, you know, I like to encourage people to um, start reading the Bible. Um, and I, I realize the Bible, to somebody who's new to the faith, it can be intimidating. You know, here's this big book and, you know, Old Testament, New Testament, what's this all about? Well, you know, the Gospel of John that tells the story of Jesus, 21 chapters. And I tell people, if you read a chapter a day of John, take you about eight or 10 minutes. And in three weeks, you've read the Gospel of John. Uh, and you've learned about the story of Jesus. Uh, I encourage people to read from Proverbs. The, that's the Old Testament book of wisdom, God's wisdom, and we all want to be wise. Well, 31 chapters in Proverbs, you can read it in a month. But here was the thing, I've been a Christian about four years, and I heard a preacher say, if you read three chapters a day, five on Sunday, you'll read the whole Bible in a year. And my wife and I got married, and we decided to do that in our first year of marriage, and then our second year, and we've done it several times. But it, you will. If you read three chapters a day, five on Sunday, you'll read the Bible in a year. And um, the Spirit of God will be your teacher. Yeah. First uh, John 2.27 says He'll teach us all things. So uh, get in the Bible. Don't let it scare you. Don't let it intimidate you. And it's amazing how the Bible will begin to shape your life. Yeah. Dr. Richardson, what are your thoughts? I totally agree with Dr. Uh, McFarlane. I mean, um, I, I would tell people to also look at John and Proverbs. And so I was started smiling when you said that because th that's usually the advice. And then also, oh, if the King James Version is uh, hey, a little bit good. daunting, there, there are other versions, English Standard yeah. Version, uh, Amplified Version. Those versions uh, help to... Uh, you know, okay. kind of help a person show, who is not I'm, familiar I'm with the these and thous and and shells oh, okay. uh, to really okay. understand. So I would I would tag on okay. to right. that as Thank well. You. Mm -hmm. It is. It's perfectly <laughs> fine. <laughs> Huge fight in a lot of churches because they're like, no, King James no, version, right. and, I, and then I ask the question, where do you think King James yes. version came from? <laughs> Somebody put this stuff together by inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but based on the time that they were in, we don't talk the same way that they were talking. And so right. I love the different translations to Hello. be able to look at it differently. I would also say for a person like me, I'm an action adventure guy. Mm. I, I would have to, I would rather peel my eyebrows off than to sit and watch Hallmark Channel. <laughs> But some people love that. I love action adventure. And so start looking at some of the stuff that is just, it's, it's crazy in the Bible, some of the stories that are in there, the wars that take place, the, the different intrigue, the sabotage. You know, it's a whole lot of stuff that's in there that's intriguing. And that way you can say, oh, this is actually a great book. Yeah. We've got another caller on the line. Caller, what's your question? Yes, hi. I was just calling to ask, um, what would be, or what would you all suggest would be the most effective way, or one of the effective ways to witness to someone that is an unbeliever? The most effective way to witness to someone that's an unbeliever, or, 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 Dr. Rice? Yeah. So here's something so cool that uh, I had our uh, ministers do, and... I, I wish I could take credit for the idea, but I had a friend in Ohio that she gave it to me. He said that the, the spirit spoke to him and told him, he said, OK, make them do it. So he had the people in his congregation make a two to three minute video on their phone talking about how they got saved and presenting the gospel to them and said, send this out to five unbelievers in your phone. And so the whole congregation got into sending the message of the gospel out. 
And so sometimes it can be intimidating uh, in a face-to-face -face conversation, but the Holy Spirit will give you boldness. But what, when, if you send somebody a video, they're going to watch it. They're going, especially if you're in their phone because you already have their number. And I thought that was the coolest idea ever. I said, wow. And so uh, that's one of the ways that you can use technology now uh, to get the gospel out to people that uh, that you may either be intimidated by or, you know, you perceive them as a hard believer. That's something that you could do uh, to witness to them. Yes. yes. And I would add to that um, the old saying, see a need, meet it. Uh, when somebody, you know, they've been in the hospital and you see their grass growing up, your neighbor, and you go down and you offer to mow their grass for them, there's, there's an affinity that, that builds, a bond that builds. When you do something for me, will you help me out? I like you. And when I like you, my ears are open uh, a lot more to hear what you've got to say. And uh, that's a great way to start a relationship with somebody that prepares the, 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 the or opens the door to share the, the truth of God's word with them. Well, I cannot believe that we are out of time. I don't know where the hour went, oh, wow. um, but we have covered an awesome topic. I don't even think we've hardly scratched the surface, but I would encourage all of you to do two things. Be discipled by somebody, somebody you trust. I would say preferably a good pastor, but somebody. Be discipled, and secondly, make disciples. Um, begin to share the truth of God's word with other people and do what Jesus said in Matthew uh, 28, go and make disciples. Well, that's what this network is doing, Global Television Network. Uh, every day, it is pumping out the truth of God's word all over the planet. And uh, so I uh, want to share my appreciation to uh, everybody involved here in the work that they're doing and encourage you to support this network. You can send uh, praise reports, prayer requests, and support to Global Television Network, 300 NC Highway 68 South, Greensboro, North Carolina, 274 Zero 09, and you can always uh, continue to call and ask for prayer at 719-820-9280. And until we broadcast again, I hope that you dig deep into God's Word, that this becomes your favorite place to be, that it comes alive to you, and that the, the words come off the page and in through your eyes and your ears and become part of who you are become part of your life and you see the truth of God's word beginning to change your life and then you will see what it means when people say Jesus is the answer. Jesus will change your life. But don't stop there. Share it with somebody else because they need Jesus just like you need Jesus. The truth of God's full gospel. The truth of God's word. Well, from everyone here at Global Television Network and the Pastor Study, we say God bless you, you disciple makers. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. The views expressed by our guests are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the Global Television Network. If you enjoyed this program, please support the Global Television Network. Send your donations to 300 NC Highway 68 South in Greensboro or you can give online at gtvnetwork.us.